Coming up on this week's show, the PlayStation is 25. Breathing new life into old games. And the man who was closest to Jack Tramiel tells us about the launch of the Commodore 64. This week's show is brought to you by Future Publishing, the brand behind the biggest names in gaming magazines. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 202, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show. Now, this is actually our final normal show of 20... Well, if you can call this podcast a normal. It's our last one that's going to be typical format of the year. Yeah, because we do like a reflection show next week yeah. and then we've got dun 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 and the Christmas quiz. <laughs> oh gosh, have you all been knuckling down, lads? <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, for people that are new to the podcast, because you know, we've had quite a lot of new listeners coming over the last couple of months. Every year, it's a bit of a retro hour tradition that we take a bit of a a bit of a breather at Christmas time and actually we do a quiz all about retro gaming. Now, for the last couple of years... Me I'm, and Ravi have smashed it. You've been the ones who've uh, <laughs> had to smashed. answer the questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think got smashed is, is a great way to word it. All right. <laughs> this year, I mean, usually I can sit back, look a bit smug, being like, because <laughs> I set all the questions. I'll be honest, my knowledge of most things is pretty terrible. Well, this is the thing, you know, we talk to all these guests and research these things, but actually when it comes down to the pressure of being on a quiz, as you've heard before, we completely lose it. I was going to say, like... Me and Ravi, we sit down together and we try to like strategically come up with the answers, you know, we're scribbling away and stuff like that. But, you know, I get frustrated with Ravi because he'll shout an answer out. But then before I know it, five questions later, I'm shouting the yeah. answers yeah. out as well. It's going to be interesting to see because we're changing teams this time. So uh, we're actually getting a team to become the quiz masters. Yeah. So Paul and Ollie, who've won the last two or three years, um, <laughs> they're going to be setting the questions this time. Now, see, in my day job, I work in music, in the music industry, because mm. I work in radio, I've, I've done a, you know, DJing for years. Whenever a music quiz is on at a pub, all my mates are like, oh, come on, a music quiz on. I always lose. I'm <laughs> terrible at quizzes. So this year, I imagine I'm going to get shown royally um, when I'm on a team with you, Joe. So yeah, so, you have to, to look forward to So it's me and Dan, and, <laughs> and, then, and, and then Ravi, and he's got a very special guest now. Uh, yeah, yeah, David Wise. So yeah, from Rare. Great. So uh, I, I did insist no questions at all to do with it, anything related to Rare. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be a bit of a giggle. That's coming up in two weeks' time our Christmas special that'll be out on the Friday before Christmas and next week we're going to be having a look back on an incredible year for the retro hour I just think 2019 shot by it, but, it's crazy yeah. and to think the diversity of guests you know we were checking people to have in this show like picking your best favourite people and oh my god I can't believe some of the people we've interviewed and some of the stories we've got they're fabulous so you're going to hear that next week this week though for our final interview of the year we're going to go out on a big one now today we're going to be talking to Michael Tomchek now he's a really interesting guy he was actually not only the marketing strategist at Commodore when they launched the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64 but also he was the assistant to Jack Tramiel now, Jack is a really interesting guy. I mean, we've had lots of guests on before about Commodore and, you know, telling us inside stories. But he's a bit of an enigma, Jack, isn't he? Because you read so many different stories about him. And a lot of it is kind of like, is that really true? But it turns out a lot of it actually is. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Michael's going to know him really well because he was his personal assistant. Yep. But also, he was involved with Apple. He was involved with Atari. So he kind of knew all about that scene. There's loads of great stories about Steve Jobs as well and... Chuck Pedal, all these kind of people that were really pioneers in the computer industry before they even had marketing, before they even sold these machines to everybody. He was also the guy that essentially wrote the manual on what should be in the Commodore VIC-20. You know, we did an episode with Neil Harris back in the summer. It kind of nicely follows on from that. And then launching the machine that became the biggest selling single model of computer in history until the Raspberry Pi overtook it like last year, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it lasted quite a yeah. long time, hasn't it? Wow. Yeah. The Commodore 64. So this is going to be a really good one. Michael Tomchek is our special guest on the show in around 15 minutes from now. Now, before we get into the stories that we need to talk about this week, every week we update you on the goings-on in the world of retro gaming. The PlayStation turned 25 this week, which makes me feel so old. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Before we do, though, let's give a huge thank you to this week's sponsor. Now, these are our very good friends at Future Publishing. Now, over the last few weeks, of course, we've been talking about one of our favourite magazines, The Brilliant Retro Gamer, which is brought to you by Future Publishing. But, I mean, I've read Future magazines for... As long as I can remember. Yeah. Even going back to stuff like Amiga Format, Amiga Power, Games Master. Le legendary company. And, you know, Edge is such a classic 
I remember when that came out in the 90s. Yeah. That was actually quite near the PlayStation, wasn't it? Well, what I thought was really interesting as well, which I had no idea until we got this, that they're behind official PlayStation yeah. magazine as well. Official PlayStation, official Xbox magazine, yeah. PC Gamer, Future Publishing, they've pretty much got you covered right across the gaming industry. Now, this month, I mean, some of their biggest magazines have got some really interesting stuff. Edge magazine are running through their games of the decade. So I just realised, we're actually going into a new decade in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, that's crazy. Like I haven't even thought about it like that at all. So that's really interesting. One game I'm really looking forward to, which uh, official PlayStation are actually reviewing in this month, is the Marvel's Avengers game. I'm really excited for that one, so check that one out as well. Well, I was a huge fan of Halo as well. Yeah. And uh, Xbox Magazine has a hands-on with Disintegration, which is a brand new sci-fi from the co-creators of Halo. And PC Gamer this month, a big preview of a strategy game called Crusaders Kings 3. It's getting a load of hype at the moment. So whether it's the industry insight provided by Edge Magazine, because they go so in-depth with their features, uh, maybe it could be the exclusive insider knowledge of official PlayStation or Xbox, there is something for everyone. And of course, this time of year... One thing I know, man, isn't it? What we're getting for Christmas. Make a nice little stocking full of this wood. So we want you to do this right now. We've got an amazing offer exclusively to Retro Hour listeners. Subscribe with the Retro Hour and get 83% off. So we're talking three issues of your favourite gaming magazine for just £3. That's crazy. That's no- mad. You normally, know, normally 18 quid in the shops. You know, I've had so many listeners contact me say... These deals are absolutely fantastic, yeah. and thanks for doing them, guys. You know. But make sure you get them while they're on, because oh, we get yes. people come like, oh, is that still on? You need to do it right now, okay? So open a new tab in your browser. Type this in, myfavouritemagazines.co.uk, RH Game. That stands for Retro Hour Game. Myfavouritemagazines.co.uk slash RH Game, and I'll put that link in our show notes. Thanks to our good friends at Future Publishing. So this week, the Sony PlayStation turned 25 years old, and there is a really good feature actually on The Verge, kind of talking about how influential the PlayStation was and how much it shaped gaming, really. The fact that, I mean, the PlayStation 5 concepts are all over the place yeah. at the moment. And you sent me a link the other day looking at um, this kind of... The development kits of the PlayStation 5. Yeah, and, uh, and the controller. And the controller, the blueprints of the controllers have apparently been leaked. I say that with inverted commas, you know, people are posting the development kits and stuff. Um which is really cool because they've got a really like kind of retro look to them, early 2000s look to them, which I think is really interesting. But what I'm thinking is the fact the controller has barely changed. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, I think it's just an iconic controller, especially from, you know, not the original, you know, the original PSX controller. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, that's iconic, but the DualShock controller. Like you say, it's it's not changed that much over the last twenty like twenty four years or however long that control. But been also out for. how how the PlayStations follow technology. So I remember twenty five years ago, I was excited to get a CD player. Yeah, yeah, you know, and then <laughs> yeah. the DVD player, and then the Blu-ray. Yeah, absolutely. you know, so they've 100%. kind of gone with technology and improved over that time. Well, I posted um, a little link on our social profiles. It's kind of talking about the PlayStation turning 25 and getting some memories. We've got some really good ones, like this one here, Jeff Owen. He said he never thought a computer game could scare him at the time. And he remembers getting PlayStation Magazine that did a demo of Silent Hill. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, that was the first yeah. that scared me as well, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Well, he said he turned it on loud at night. He thought, ah, oh, this game can't scare me. It was, uh, you know, the demo that with the, the school with the ghost kids in it, wasn't it? Yeah. And he said he lasted five minutes before he turned the light on. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, you, you definitely weren't alone there. Uh, James said he, he remembers getting a uh, £20 mod chip installed by some random guy in Mansfield on a Saturday morning and he got a free copy of Colin McRae rally thrown in as well um, Steve he talks about playing Command and Conquer on Christmas Day still the best Christmas present he ever got a lot of people are talking about that moment when the dogs burst through the window in Resident Evil oh god what an iconic moment <laughs> wasn't it just I mean have you got any like you know what, what's your kind of fondest memories of the original PlayStation yeah, you know, I, think, uh, I think for me we got our PlayStation, I think it was, I want to say Christmas 95. We got our same year, yeah. Yeah, so it'd been out for a little while. Christmas 95, for me, it's always going to stick in my mind. We got Porsche Challenge, Soul Blade, uh, aka Soul Calibur, but Soul Blade, or Soul Edge, sorry, Hardcore 4x4 and Soviet Strikes. Yep. Just, I just, those games are just ingrained into my brain. But what I love, I absolutely love my dad to bits for getting it for us. But the Player 2 port controller port did not work what out of the box 
and then after about three or four days, controller port one stopped working, and it turned out it got it from a man at the pub. <laughs> <laughs> and then about four days later, bless him, he came, he'd gone back to work, and he came back from work with a big, massive Virgin Mega Stores bag, and he'd bought us a brand new, fully working two-player PlayStation. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, just a, such a good memory for me, that is just playing those games with my brother. What about you? I, I just remember, like... Micro Machines V3 yeah. coming out. Oh, yeah. And that was the first title I got, and I just absolutely came that. But also the technology that came out of it, because I remember we were all obsessed with our light guns and getting the um, G, G-Con? G-Con, yeah, was, G-Con 45. That was it, and people trying to get recoil ones and all different oh, types man. of light guns. And it, there was a huge scene of uh, yeah. Time Crisis guys and stuff. I love that. Even like games like Parappa the Rapper, I remember like you know yeah. the first time I put that out, I was like, "This is so different." Yeah. And Abe's Odyssey, when he farted, it was like you know I never I never seen that in a game before. <laughs> I, I still know the Prapper Rapper rap. Go on, it, kick is, punch, it's all in the mind. <laughs> <laughs> He's like kick punch block. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, what a legendary system! And I was reading the other day that the, the PlayStation brand in general has now sold 450 million consoles. My friend messaged me that he's yeah. just got a PS4, bless him. Yeah. And uh, the next oh, day, you could say he's just got he's a just PS4. Got a PS4. <laughs> no, he's just got a PS4 and he messaged me the next day after, he messaged me I've got a PS4 messaged me the next day with that link and he was like this was me this is because right. of me yeah. <laughs> so happy birthday Sony PlayStation here's to 25 more years of PlayStation consoles now let's talk about a system that's slightly more old school one of the systems that kind of got cast by the wayside because of the PlayStation but we love it so the Sega Mega Drive oh. now this is something we did talk about the Terra Onion Mega SD now, this is, it's one of those um, SD cards. You put this in the top of your old school Mega Drive. You can play all your favorite games by downloading ROMs. But the big difference with this one is it allows you to play Mega CD games as well. Yeah. Now, there's a really good YouTube video that I'll link up in our show notes by um, Digital Foundry, who are like a really good YouTube channel. And they've kind of put it through their paces. And there's some really interesting stuff in there. Not only can you obviously play all your, your standard ROMs that you download, you also get... Um, Master system compatibility, kind of free yeah. with the Mega Drive because it's built into it. But the fact you can play these Mega CD games in here as well. So essentially it has an optical disc emulator in there. And you don't, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't actually need a Mega CD, do you? It won't actually work with the Mega CD plugged in. Wow. Because they actually have to physically remove the Mega CD because I didn't know this. Apparently the edge connector where you plug it into the bottom yeah. on the, uh, the Mega Drive it's actually on the same line of the bus that goes up in the cartridge slot. Oh, oh, so they could have made it like a top loader kind of thing. So, so I'm guessing this also saves on having like a mechanical CD-ROM with, yeah. your, with your Mega CD and that breaking. You know. I mean, the issue with the reason EverDrives and stuff like that haven't been able to do Mega CD games before yeah. is because you remember the Mega CD had extra hardware in there. We know yeah, the yeah, rotations yeah. and stuff yeah. it could do as well. So this, um, this cartridge here... It actually has an FPGA on there with the essentially the Mega CD kind of BIOS can be stored on there. So, so that's justifying the price because it is one nine five. Yeah. So it's a bit of a niche item, but that's awesome. It must be very accurate with the FPGA. Yeah, I mean, looking at it, it actually loads quicker than the optical disc, as you'd expect, because you know it's it's um, probably memory. two speed, wasn't it? Or something like. <laughs> I, I think it might have been single speed yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there is actually a really good homebrew scene that's kind of popping up around this already, and this is something that's existed already on the SNES on the, the flashcards you can get on that, whereas this can actually play WAV files. Oh, cool. Okay. So what people have been doing is modding old games and actually putting kind of CD-quality music <laughs> in the games. So there is already a list. There's about 10 or 15 games you can download, and they've like taken the soundtracks off maybe the PlayStation version or something yeah, yeah. and backported it to this, so putting it over the sound effects of the game. So it can kind of bring, breathe new life into your old games as well, which I think is really cool. That's awesome. And are you a fan of Mega CD games? Yes and no. Like, I find them really, really interesting. I think there's some absolute gems out, like, out there for the Mega CD, like the Terminator game. What's putting me off this is the price tag. Yeah, yeah. But so, then at the same time, if you don't have a Sega CD and you want to play Sega CD games and you want, you know, the, emu you know, you want the emulation, I was going to call it an EverDrive then, and you want, you know, to play these games and you don't want to spend all that money on these games, then personally, I think this is amazing. Yeah, because how much, how much is a Mega CD now to buy? Like, like 200 pounds. You're talking pounds. that anyway, yeah. You're talking that anyway. Mm. The thing is, I already have a Mega CD. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I'm not, you know, kind of like raring to go to get one, but I've, oh, you are selling it for me. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there are some amazing Mega CD emulators. 
and it really does emulate it perfectly. So I, I was playing Night Trap on my Wii U yeah, the yeah. other day, and it was just <laughs> absolutely amazing. It was like it was built for the kind of console. I mean, you you often talk about this bit rot as well that you get on discs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, that can be a big problem. And you know, if you don't, know, and especially it's a, it's a delicate system as well. The original mm. Mega CD. I was getting nervous transporting it. I wouldn't dare take it around a friend's house, for example. But this you can just slot it in. Mine, you... like my wife opens the curtains in our games room, and the sun goes straight onto like not that it's going to. <laughs> affect my mega cd i'm like close the curtains <laughs> <laughs> like it's a vampire yeah. it's gonna melt or something so yeah i mean if you do want to wait and afford a semi-affordable way of playing these systems cheaper than getting the original i, I think the there's a little bonus here which is they're saying in-game menu for fast swapping yeah uh, that's cool that's yeah. one thing that you're not going to be have as well kind of an in-game menu in the emulators you know and I do love having flashcards as well because it just means you have everything on there. And you know, Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, so if you want to check out that, I'll put a link in the show notes if you uh, want to get yourself one for Christmas. Oh. <laughs> the RetroAd.com. <laughs> Speaking of breathing lives into new games as well, have you heard about randomizers? I've heard of it, but I've not really checked it out. So I've not really read this story yet because I was kind of hoping that you'd give me a little bit more, <laughs> well, you guys would give me a bit more of an insight on it. Typical this. lazy Joe. I, yeah. had a, I had a look <laughs> over it and... It's crazy. Shall I tell you what it is? Okay. So this is essentially, there's a scene going on at the moment where there's probably games that you've played a million times. Yeah. As soon as you put it on, you know exactly which, you know, if you play Mario, the first Mario, for example. Well, the screenshot I've got here Mm -hmm. is Legend of Zelda Link to the Past of the SNES, but there's a Mega Man sprite in it. That's one of my favorite games of all time. The next one along, we've got the Final Fantasy VI status screen, another one of my favorites, but all the characters are all characters from other SNES RPGs and classic games. So I'm assuming it's... I'm not, I'm not. I'm assuming it's not just a palette swap. It's actual like game asset swaps. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it could be between games, or it could be a simple case of reorganizing a game. Okay. So you get different enemies in different levels, yeah. different so, doors so, taking different so places. So does this get all the sprites, level maps, and all of that, and then just totally randomize it and create something completely new? Yeah. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, you know, it's a randomizer. So then what it'll do is it'll take all these assets from games. It can combine two games. You can just shuffle up one of your favorite so, games and move. Things around so i'm reading this comes from the speed running scene yeah which is absolutely crazy but kind of they're doing now speed running events with randomizers so yeah. randomizer <laughs> tournaments with a prize of three thousand pounds so i guess it's like you might have a lot of chance in that one then depending on what games you get and if you get the right items to complete the game and i think it was needed too because you think of speed running the longer that we've been playing these games, the challenge probably kind of goes out the window a bit, and it gets a bit stale, because, I mean, like I said, now if you play the original Mario, you know exactly when to press jump, you know exactly which enemies are going to come along. Yeah, you know, yeah. you, you don't really have to pay attention anymore. But actually kind of making it seem like a kind of new take on that game, I think is, and especially like for competitive well, events like I, that. I've been watching this really nerdy thing. It's called geo-guessing. Right. And you, you basically get a picture on Google Maps, and you have like a certain amount of time to guess where it is in England or whatever. <laughs> and uh, that's totally random because it's just chucking you up there. But there's a huge competition. There's people trying to get certain scores. It's like, I think randomness and competitive kind of gaming is really good. How close are these zoomed in then? Is it like a sheep in a field? Or you, you'll have like a road and you'll have to go down and find the name of the council on the bins and stuff. It's great. <laughs> that sounds kind of fun, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, re- really interesting. I mean, if you are into speed running and stuff like that, I think, you know, this kind of stuff does kind of make it a bit more exciting and a bit more of a challenge again. Now, before we get into our guest this week, Michael Tomchet talking about Jack Tramiel and launching the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64, another famous brand from the past, the Intellivision Amico. Now, we've been talking about this over the last couple of months on the show, haven't we? Yeah, so this is a new console that's been developed by uh, Tommy Tallarico, yep. and this is uh, he's bought the Intellivision brand. He's kind of bringing it back for family gaming, and um, we've seen a few exclusive titles coming out for this. But if you guys check this video as well, He's now talking about the controller, and this controller is probably like something we've never seen before on a gaming console. So it's got a big jog wheel on it, yeah. which which kind of reminds me of those early um, iPods. Like iPods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say it looks like an iPod. And it's got these um, side buttons on it as well. But if you look at some of the demonstrations that they're doing on the video, I think it's got an actuator in it because he's able to move little items. Like a Wiimote kind of thing. Like more like on your mobile phone when you're kind of uh, tilting it and you oh, accelerometer thing. Acceler- yeah, okay, that's yeah. that's the word accelerometer. Yeah, but then he's also um, 
he shows a little clip where he's kind of spinning around on the jog wheel and then there's a little tempest display that comes up on it and he goes oh i'm not going to show you anymore see so, that would be good to play tempest with yeah but then i mean is that going to work with all kinds of games though I don't know. I guess there'll be different ways of yeah. controlling them, but it, it, it maybe turn it on its side it or something. It feels really familiar to me to the uh, VMU for the Dreamcast. Now, don't get me wrong, this obviously looks a lot more advanced than that and stuff, but I, I'm, my initial thought is, you know, oh, yeah, brilliant, let's go play Tempest with it, but then is it just going to work for one or two, you know, a handful of games? Because, you know, the VMU for the Dreamcast had, you know, its own, like, for Sonic Adventure, its own little, like, chow... Uh, mini game, mini it, game yeah. and stuff like that. But then you stick it into Resident Evil and it just displays your health. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it would be interesting to see well, what it does. as you mentioned earlier, the PlayStation control has not changed in 25 <laughs> years. Well. So it's good to see a new a new type coming out. Although there could be a reason for that, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, apparently we're going to get a lot more about the um, Intellivision Amico. 40th anniversary of the Intellivision as well. They're going to be, uh, apparently, a pretty big presence at E3. I've just been reading in this article here on edgeallshockers.com and it's uh, aimed to be released at the end of 2020 so I'm sure we'll hear more about that as the months go on. Right, we've got our retro picks coming up in just a moment but before we do that like we said before, it's been an incredible year on this podcast and uh, we couldn't have made it this far without you guys and your very, very generous support. Now, every week on the show, we have the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. This is where we roll out the red carpet and say huge thank you to those people who help keep the show going, throw a couple of quid into the tip jar, and every week we give Joe a little test. Here we go. So have you been revising during the week then, Joe? No, but I've just been scrambling my brain because I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> How do you make a donation and get into the Hall of Fame? So you go onto our website, theretrohour.com, Come. That's it. There we go. Got it right. And you go onto the supporters link. And there's a little tab there, and you can pay through any currency, and you can pay through PayPal, and any amount will go back into the running of the show. And then, of course, you get a mention in a future episode in, in the Hall of Fame, which is the most prestigious high score table, absolutely, in the world of retro gaming. Like this week, we want to say a big thank you to Mark Thompson, James Stewart. Jan Oratowski and Benjamin Beach who all made donations into the running of the show and if you'd like to do the same it would be massively appreciated and you'd really be helping us go into 2020 head to our website at theretrohour.com now our retro picks this is where every week we talk about something that's caught our eye in the world of retro gaming this week and you've been watching your mate GBS Engineering on YouTube yeah so this is my mate Howard we're making a, a, an Amiga laptop at the moment and he's kind of a, a mad inventor I'd say and he, he does amazing stuff on his channel so he built a robot lawnmower right that's kind I of need like, one of those actually yeah that's like a rumba that went round and you've cut you've been going it. on about one, getting one of them for ages about five years yeah. even before I had a lawn <laughs> there's, there's a great one where he finds a mobility scooter at the side of the road he puts a solar panel on the top and then drives to the pub <laughs> so, <laughs> check out Dubious Engineering on YouTube really good channel now I'm going to show you guys what's my retro pit this week check out this hello what's this have, have a look at this now this That's is Pinball it. Dreams brilliant game that you know, I used to love on the Commodore Amiga we've mentioned these guys before this is a bad I want to see Joe's reaction to the cartridge uh, that's not a cartridge yeah <laughs> to, to the disc yeah oh, what do you wonderful. think that is Joe I just don't know. <laughs> wow. This is a three-inch floppy disk. Now, these were like, they're only really used on like some Sinclair machines, mainly Amstrad, wasn't it, back yeah. in the day? Yeah. But this is a really good port of Pinball Dreams for the Amstrad CPC by the Batman Group. They've actually released it as a physical product and very kindly sent me one. I need to get an Amstrad now to play it on, which <laughs> I'm absolutely going to do. But I just think that looks like... That could have been a commercial quality game in the early 90s. When you pulled it out of your bag, I thought you genuinely had a retro game. That yeah, This yeah. was not a new release, but you see BG Games in the corner and you know it's a new one. But my God, this is well done. Yeah, so thank you so much for sending that. Um, I'll put a link if you want to get hold of your own copy of it. What's your choice this week then, Joe? Uh, so I've actually been checking out uh, somebody who we've had on the show before, not too long ago, an absolute fantastic guest, uh, the Happy Console Gamer. So yeah. Happy Console Gamer has just done a video, came out this week, Video Game Buyer's Guide, 2019 happy console gamer so essentially this is his top picks of you know anybody who's a kind of a retro game fan or just a game fan or somebody who might have been a game fan back in the day back in their youth uh, and you're struggling to get them a present or anything and it's just his top picks like top christmas pick ideas ranging from ps4 switch xbox one games some really good games over the last year that have come out some really good picks but then what i absolutely loved which i wasn't expecting at the end is he starts talking about data discs right. uh, which is a great vinyl company and oh, then he yeah. also talks about our friends at bitmap books as well oh, cool. uh, and he reviews their books as well which you know we've had on the show and stuff before 
before. And he just goes into a great death and he just he does it with so much passion and energy. And I just loved it. I just thought it was a great video. I love Johnny's videos anyway. Yeah, They're yeah. really from the heart. That's great. A buyer's guide, uh, just in time for Christmas. Yeah, I know. So. I felt like yeah. sending it to my mum. <laughs> <laughs> Have some tips. Yeah. Watch this and buy me everything in Watch this video. Watch your Christmas list. There you go. <laughs> so if you want to check out any of our pics this week and everything else we talked about, we'll put all that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. If you are thinking about Christmas present ideas as well, we have a little merch store that um, a few people yep. have been getting hold of these, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. I, I want to see photos of you guys in the t-shirts. We've had quite a few orders, so I'd love to see that. And also drinking tea out your retro hour mugs. Yeah, or something more medicinal this time, yeah, maybe. <laughs> so uh, if you want to get hold of that, check out Some the... mold uh, wine. <laughs> what's it called? The merchandise our shopping section? Uh, you know it's on Teespring. So if you go to the retrohour.com yep. and you just click shop on the menu, it will take you straight there. Fantastic. Well, next, we're going to get some incredible stories about launching legendary systems like the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64 and working alongside Jack Tramiel with Michael Tomchek. Hello, Michael. Hi, Dan. How are you? Yeah, very good, thank you. How are you, Michael? Fine. Hi to all your podcast fans. I'm a fan of your podcast, by the way. I still have a keen interest in everything retro and the legacy of Commodore and home computing, so uh, I'm a huge supporter of everything you're doing. Fantastic. Well, we've had a few of your colleagues on the podcast in the past, so it's, uh, it's great to get you on and get your stories as well. It's my pleasure. Well, we are going to hear more from you, Michael, and your time at Commodore and the home computer wars in the early 80s next on the Retro Hour podcast. Enjoying the show? Why not check out some other great retro gaming podcasts like Retro Asylum, RGDS, Maximum Power Up, Arcade Attack, Arcade Perfect, and the 10 Pence Arcade. <laughs> This harks back to 1979. I had graduated from UCLA. I had I got an MBA. I had already been in the Army. I was a captain in the Army. I had done some consulting. I was actually a consultant in Beverly Hills doing marketing, product launches, investor relations. And I wanted to manage something. So I took a job managing a small company that did special effects for movies based in San Francisco. So I moved from Los Angeles to San Francisco. One day, one of our clients, which was Atari, brought in a, a game machine. We did a lot of special effects for them. And this game machine had a game called Star Raiders, which had uh, star fields built into the firmware. So when you played the game, you thought you were going right through space. You could see the stars going by. And this was the first game that did it. And the reason it had those star, star, uh, star fields is because the programmer who did it uh, was a chip designer. And he just designed the game based on this firmware with these star fields. It was really exciting. My staff wouldn't stop playing this darn game. So finally, I took it home. Three nights later, three mornings later, I looked up from my living room table and I, I saw a thin shaft of light coming in through the curtains. And I realized I'd been up three nights in a row playing this stupid <laughs> game. I had one hour of sleep three nights in a row. So I quit my job. I turned down a participation in the company. I lived off my savings for six months. I had been a journalist in college and a little bit in the army. And so I started doing interviews for magazines. Then I went down to Apple and I used this as an excuse to get in the door to interview Wozniak and Jobs. And after a while, I was hanging out at Apple looking for story ideas and I could walk in the front door and walk back to Wozniak's cubicle and sit there with him and, and nobody stopped me. The guards used to get mad at me because I used to violate the security. I, I wouldn't put on the badge and I just look at them and say, hey, you guys all know me, come on. And I just walk past them and they get so mad at me. But <laughs> Wozniak and Jobs, they just shrugged. And uh, so Jobs and Wozniak offered me a job they said, uh, go in the cafeteria, find a job you're qualified for, and we'll hire you for that. So I said, that's fine, except Apple had too many geniuses. I would be lost in the crowd no matter how good or bad I was. So then I went to Atari, and Conrad Judson, a vice president there, I did an interview with him. I also tapped him for a job. And he invited me to be director of software, and I got really angry because I was very naive at the time, despite my experiences in the Army and so forth. I was very naive. So I said, software? Why does Atari want to hire me for as a software director? I'm a marketing guy. They should offer me a marketing guy. So I was actually angry. So then I had known some people who knew Jack Trammell, and I said I had also taken basic programming courses at computer stores. And I was a self-taught sort of computer guy. And one night we would use Commodores. 
The next night we would use apples, so I became ambidextrous. And I could compare the two systems. And I got a, as a product manager by trade, I kind of got a sense for what was possible. So I got myself an interview with Jack Trammell. I walked in. He was sitting behind a huge modern glass table with very few papers on it and glass windows looking outside in uh, Santa Clara, California. And he had a deep, booming voice. And he was a short, rotund guy whose belly was so round he could put his hands in his waistband of his <laughs> of his pants and he was really short but he had this booming baritone voice that literally made the walls vibrate when he talked he was like talked with a very light european polish accent and he said so <clears throat> what do you know about commodore and i said well i don't know much about commodore but People who know you seem to think you're some kind of crook. But I figure if you're not in prison, you're not a crook. You're just a shrewd businessman. And I'd like to learn to be shrewd like that. The reason I can repeat that little speech is because I practiced it 45 minutes in front of the mirror at home so I could get it right. Wow. I had nothing to lose. So I threw the insult dice on the table and Jack's expression didn't change one iota. He just looked at me and said, what else? And I said, well, I think your company's kind of screwed up. You've got half geniuses and half idiots in the company. I can name 20 things wrong with the company. Horrible ads, uh, 1940s packaging, bad relations with user groups. You have the best technology, but nobody knows about it. And I went on and on and on. And Jack said, okay. He said, hmm, you know, my assistant just left. He, uh, you know, he had, there was a lot of turnover at Commodore. Jack was hard to work for, and a lot of people lost patience and exited the company off and on. And he looked at me and he said, my assistant just left. He was 50 years old. He was beloved in the company, so I need a new assistant. But I don't know if I have the luxury to train somebody to learn the religion. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, I consider business... My business philosophy, the religion, you know, we treat every penny as our own. Business is like war. You have to be engaged and fight hard and all these other things. And he started rattling off some of the elements of the religion. And I was intrigued by that. And I said, that's my kind of uh, thing. I was in real war and I was in combat in Vietnam. I had to actually go AWOL to go into combat. I snuck away for two weeks to go out with the last combat patrol of the 1st Cav Division. So I had experienced combat, and so I understood what he meant when he said business is war. So he said, let me think about it. Call me tomorrow. So I left. The next day I called in 11 times. 11 times. I'm not exaggerating. Every hour I called in, and his secretary screened me. Jack didn't make up his mind yet. He doesn't know what he's going to do with you. He's having breakfast. He's meeting with people. He's gone to lunch, but he promises he'll call you when he gets back. He's finally getting an idea what to do with you. Call back later. Okay, 7 p.m. at night. I said, I'm going to call Commodore, and if he doesn't hire me, I'm going to Apple, and they can't. I won't go work for Commodore if they come on bended knee. At 7 o'clock at night, my last call Everybody's gone from the company. Jack is walking past his secretary's desk and the phone rings. It's me. He picks it up and he goes, Ah, oh, Michael, um, I figured out what I'm going to do with you. Uh, why don't you come in and we'll talk about it? So I went in and he said, I'm going to hire you to be my assistant. You'll be assistant to the president, but you won't assist me. Your job will be to follow me around and learn the religion. And after six months, after you've learned the religion, I'll give you something significant to do. And he said, what's the least amount of money you can make and be comfortable? And I told him, you know, a couple thousand a month, I guess. And he said, okay, then I'll make it up to you in six months. So I was hired. And I said, oh, by the way, I'd like to add the title marketing strategist because I have a lot of ideas on how to improve your marketing and I want a formal title. And he said, sure. So he, he, I said, so when do I start? And he said, well, you can, I have to go to London. We're holding our first ever managers meeting of all of the senior managers of Commodore. And we're going to plan our future strategy. And you can, you can join after I get back 
or you could meet me in London. Of course, I said, I'll meet you in London. <laughs> I want to be there. I said, you want me to learn things? I have to be there. He said, okay. So the next thing I know, I'm on the plane to London, and guess who sits next to me by coincidence? Chuck Peddle, the, the, the developer of the pet, and, and his wife. Chuck and I had like an hours-long conversation. He briefed me on everything I needed to know about the company, including politics, the nuances of Jack's management style, all of this. So when we got to London, we went to the Fox and Hounds estate outside of London. Kit Spencer, who was the head of marketing, he was the kind of the UK Commodore guru, and Bob Gledo was the general manager. Kit sort of took me under his wing. His He and his wife, Leslie, and their little daughter, Marie, before we got started, took, took us on a tour of Windsor Castle, took us to Parliament. I actually sat on the green leather seats. I don't know if anyone can do that anymore, but I actually was allowed in, and I sat on those green leather seats. It was fascinating. How they got in, got us in, I have no idea, but they had a lot of pull. Um, Kit Spencer was actually became my role model. He was the guy who had done so much in terms of product management and and development of the pet system at the, in the UK. He he became my best friend at Commodore. So he was a junior Wimbledon champ. He was a distant relative of Lady Diana Spencer, and he was a thin, blonde, handsome, erudite, eloquent, very cool, and super effective as a marketeer. When we got to London. Uh, we wound, I found myself in a room a, uh, with a square table with green tablecloths and Chuck Peddle was sitting beside me and he was proposing uh, a color version of the pet shaped like an apple. If you look at the pictures of the prototype on the table in front of him from that era, you can see it looks like an apple too. It's exactly the same form factor. They had code names for it. They called it the toy, T-O-I. They called it uh, uh, the color pet. They had all kinds of names for it. That was supposed to be our apple killer. Well, Jack came in. Jack knew that a semiconductor engineer who was originally an intern at MOS Technology, our semiconductor factory, he had taken a chip that they developed called the VIC video interface chip. And he had made a prototype for a school project, and he turned it into a little computer. He had a little keyboard. It worked with a monitor. And Jack had seen that, and he said, you know, I want a small introductory computer. And I went, wow, my ears perked up, because as a marketing strategist, I felt that Commodore didn't have the low-cost niche. We needed kind of a game computer, an intro computer, something small, but full-featured. Jack talked about it a little bit, and then he said, okay, I have to leave for a day. I'll be back tomorrow. So we went over all the mundane stuff, finance, sales, but everybody at the table except three or four of us wanted a big computer. They wanted to be IBM. They wanted to be Apple. They wanted to have something bigger and more powerful, and they thought they had to chase Apple. And I said, no, we've got to have this small computer. And if you look at pictures, I have dark circles under my eyes that day. And you can see that in the photographs because I had no sleep. I don't sleep sitting up on the plane. Uh, Chuck Peddle and his wife found an empty seat. And one of them slept on the floor and one of them slept in the seats. And I had to sit sleep sitting up, but I they got no sleep. So I had these dark circles under my eyes. And I'm arguing passionately, we need the, to fill the low niche. Because in marketing terms, here's how it goes. We capture them with a low-end computer, about $300. At this time, computers cost $600 minimum. We need to get ki people in kindergartens and grade schools to be able to afford them in large families. It should hook up to a television set, should have games with it, like cartridges like Atari. And we get this computer out. Everybody will get into computers using our small-end intro machine. Then they'll trade up to the Commodore PET, which they'll see in schools where we were pretty dominant along with Apple. And then when they graduate school, they'll buy our new CBM line, which hadn't been launched yet, and they'll do business computers. And we'll have the whole spectrum, but we got to get them at the start, at the low end. And I argued passionately for that. Kit Spencer was on my side. Tony Tokai, the general manager of Japan, was on my side. He had an engineer with him named Yash Terakura. And I think one other person, we were just three, four of us were arguing against uh, 20, 
20 seasoned executives, mostly with gray hair. And Jack came back and he listened to the arguments and they were pretty heated because the the senior executive st- strategy was, we need $1,000 computers, $600, $700 computers. We need big revenues. And I said, no, we need a $300 computer with a lot of peripherals to make it like a $1,500 sale starting at 300. And nobody will realize that once you got the 300, you need a disk drive and joysticks and cartridges and modems and all these other things. It's a $1,500 product. So Jack listened and then when he was done, he stood up and he looked around and he, he, he pounded his fist on the table to stop the discussion. And he went, bang. And I'd seen him do this like going forward during the years I was there. Many, many times he just pounded his fist on the table and he said, he said these fateful words, gentlemen, the Japanese are coming, so we will become the Japanese. And everybody shut up and they understood exactly what he meant because if we didn't do this small computer, the Japanese would. Jack didn't suffer fools and he, he wanted results and, and, and he had an instinct instinctive way of he had like a sixth grade education but he had an instinctive way of pulling out the solutions to technical problems even though he didn't understand the technology fully he could pull things out of semiconductor engineers that they didn't even know were possible jack was a six year survivor of auschwitz he worked on labor gangs once when we went to germany after london we were driving on the autobahn one one time and he looked around and he was actually driving And I was a passenger, and he looked at me, and he said, I helped build this road. And he didn't say it with regret. He said it with pride. He said, I helped build this road. He said, "It's we did a good job. And I, uh, another time we were sitting at a a diner having a sandwich, and I turned to him, and I very bluntly asked, how do you deal with the memories of the Holocaust? I mean, his father was killed in the camps, and so many other things happened. And he looked at me without blinking an eye and he said, I live in the future. And I adopted that as my personal motto for the rest of my life, except my meaning for live in the future was not to forget the past. The meaning for me was to embrace the future, make the future happen faster and be an innovation champion and an innovator and somebody who could change things. Jack also said at that London meeting, I want to make computers for the masses, not the classes. And that's what shut up the senior executives who wanted the higher level computers. He said, that was his, that's his most famous quote. I want to make computers for the masses, not the classes. And those of us who bought into that became very successful. And now 40 years later, we're kind of known as uh, technology pioneers because we helped Jack fulfill his vision. And although I talk sometimes about my accomplishments and my contributions, these are Jack Trammell's visionary achievement. This is we were fulfilling Jack Trammell's vision. So, the first day, well, the first couple of days, we went to London and started the Vic Twenty on its way. The second week, we went to Germany and got a good deal on a factory to make computers in Europe. And the third week, we came back to the United States and fired the marketing department. Jack said, go check out the marketing department. I know you you dislike them so and everything they're doing, so go tell me what you think. So I went back to the marketing department, 12 people, and I did interviews with all of them. And one guy was sleeping with his secretary, although he was married. Another guy was doing cocaine, but he used to carry a Dristan bottle and talk about his sinuses, and he had bad sinuses, so he had to do this all day, but he was really using cocaine. The PR person had ju- uh, had just thrown out two days earlier all the customer service cards, which were the records of all the customers who ever bought Commodore. Everything was going cr- horribly. So I came back and told Jack in a very official sort of way, not biased or with any prejudice. I just told him what I found. After about three days, I came, I went to lunch. So it was like this. I went to lunch, I came back, all the offices were empty. I went to the marketing secretary and she was writing on a notepad and looking down and writing and I said, what happened to the marketing department? And she said, they're gone, Jack fired them. I went, excuse me? She said, Jack came and fired them while you were at lunch. And I said, what do you mean? And I said, 
you don't seem upset by this. She was looking down at her pad the whole time. She never once looked at me. And she was just writing. And I said, does this happen very often? And she said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, yes, it does. <laughs> he fires whole groups at a time. So I ran into Jack's office and I said, Jack, Jack, what happened? What did you do? What happened? And Jack said, he said, this is her exact word. He said, well, you said you hated the marketing department, so I fired them. He said, no. <laughs> he said, well, they're kind of incompetent, so we got rid of, we just clean house. He said, so here's the deal. You go hire a marketing department that you think is are the people we need, and I'll hire a marketing vice president and we'll split the duties that way. And I went, okay. I was so naive. I was like, okay, yep, yep, yep. You know, I was like Radar O'Reilly and the Colonel in the in the TV series MASH. It was like, just whatever you say, Colonel, you know, so off I went. And uh, a few days later at another meeting, he said, well, you know, Michael Tomchik in a very short space of time has shown he understands the company, maybe because he's a journalist, but he understands it almost as good as I do. So uh, he's going to be U.S. Director of Marketing as he puts together the marketing team, and then he'll move on to other things after that. And I still continued to be assistant to the president. Now, this is three weeks after we were in London. Now, here's where we get to the VIC-20. So one day, I, I went back to my office, and I was thinking about that home computer the whole time, so I wrote a 30-page single-spaced memo. And when I was done, I didn't know what to do, put on the front of it, so I drew a happy face. I did it in longhand originally because I didn't have my CBM system yet. This is mostly on sales and marketing ideas, but the other one was on what to do with the VIC. Full-size typewriter keyboards, $300 price point, usually actually $299.95. That's the ideal price point. RS-232, IEEE interface, joysticks, cartridge games, memory expansion, and I wrote all the things that should be in the new computer, ideally. You know, when I took it to Jack, I threw it on his desk, and he said, what's this? And I said, that's everything should be done with a new computer. Make sure whoever's in charge does all these things. So he said, okay. Almost a week later, he came back and he threw this back on my desk. And I said, what's this? And he said, it's everything should be done with a new computer. You're in charge of making it happen. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I've told everybody in the company who's involved with this that nothing gets done with a new computer unless they – they run it by you and they need your approval. Now, none of these people work for you, so you're going to have to do it by persuasion and a little bit with my authority. And I went, oh, I can handle that. I didn't care about corporate titles and things like that. And I said, can I be the Vic product manager? And he said, no, I don't believe in product management. I don't believe in product managers. And I said, so what can I be? And at this time in Washington, we had a gas shortage, and they had an energy czar created to solve that problem with long lines at gas pumps and all kinds of things. And Jack said, you can be the Vic czar. And I said, can I put that on my business card? And he said, sure. So I actually had business cards made that said Vic czar. <laughs> and I then commenced to have uh, meetings with different people. Uh, and he also said, along the way, Chuck Peddle resigned. He didn't want to do the small computer first. He wanted to do the color pet. A couple of engineers went with him. So this was dumped in the lap of a few remaining engineers who agreed to work on it. But most of the work had to be done in Japan. So some of these engineers, it was kind of a patchwork quilt of engineers working on this uh, to make the chip happen and put the features in. I held a couple of meetings with those engineers and they said, so what are your what's your guidance? I said, I have two areas of guidance. One, put in the features that are in my memo if you can put them in. And two, this has to be a friendly computer. It must be user friendly because at the time, believe it or not, it's hard to believe today, Computers were not user-friendly, and people were actually resisting the notion of user-friendliness, and I was waving that flag. So when I went to Japan to talk to Tony Tokai and the Japanese engineers, because we were going to have to do the Japanese version first, Yash Terakura, one day I said to Yash Terakura, this must be user-friendly. And Yash looked at me and he said, Michael-san, of course this will be user-friendly. I am user-friendly engineer. And so I knew it was going to be user-friendly. 
Tony Tokai said, what do you want to call it? And I said, first of all, I want to call it the Commodore Spirit. And he said, Commodore Spirit doesn't mean Casper the Friendly Ghost in Japan. It means horrible flesh-eating, soul-stealing ghoul from hell. <laughs> and it's not going to fly here. So come up with another name. So the next name I came up with, with the engineers who were kind of calling it Vicky or the Vixen, because the main driving chip was called, the microprocessor was called the video interface chip, VIC. So they were calling it Vixen or Vicky, and so I said, let's call it the Vixen. I have a whole memo in longhand of my sketches of a little fox and Vixen. It's a whole marketing plan for a small computer called the Vixen. Well, we're in the middle of the Vixen, and we find out from Germany that Vixen, especially in Germany and also in the U.S., kind of means has pornographic connotations. Apparently, there were films with that name and a few other things. <laughs> and so Vixen wasn't just a female fox. It was something else and had other connotations. So that idea was scratched. So then I said, let's go with Vic and Jack actually also said, Jack and me and the engineers simultaneously came to the conclusion we should call it the Vic. And I said, we're going to call it the Vic 20. And Jack said, why 20? And I said, because 20 is a friendly number. 5, 20, 100, those are friendly numbers. It had nothing to do with the Vic's technical thing. Uh, basically, it was called Vic 20 because Vic sounds like a truck driver's name. So I said it has to have something with it. So I just said Vic 20, and that just tripped off the tongue. And then we got the great idea to do William Shatner, and William Shatner was interested because he had been doing Promise Margarine commercials. And he, he's, he told me later that he wished he would have done something in technology instead of going with Promise Margarine because it was a natural for him to help promote technology and he did he wasn't thinking along those lines so he was really happy to get involved with Commodore I was at the first TV shoot in New York uh, Shatner came in and we had some really nice sweaters for him that looked just like Star Trek he took one look at those and he said my contract won't allow me to, to wear those I can't be Captain Kirk in ads so our female staff ran out and bought a bunch of sweaters his size, came back and gave him a different sweater. And he said, that's more like it. So then we posed for a couple of pictures. It's funny, the pictures of me with William Shatner don't show a cord connected to the Vic because the feed to the monitor was coming from our engineers so we wouldn't have raster scan lines. If you just did it from the Vic and you photographed it, you would see the refresh lines of the TV scrolling down over the screen and that would be unacceptable. So we had to feed it direct. So the, the, the computer we posed with for our pictures isn't really connected to the TV. <laughs> But a few people picked up on that years later when that picture became well publicized. So I have a picture of me with William Shatner. Now, here's the historical trivia bit. That's the first time William Shatner ever touched a real computer because the computers on Star Trek were fake. Not only that, but we delivered some pet CBM systems to his home, sent some, one of my people out to uh, train him. And he then got into word processing and he started writing novels and scripts. And I think that we got him started in that. Last year, I contacted him through his assistant and asked if he'd be willing to sign a picture. And he said, not only w would he sign one, send a couple and I'll, I'll sign a couple. He was thinking about me having something of value. Isn't that neat? Yeah. He, he signed three copies of that picture. One of them he signed, thanks, Michael which is on the screen, which is actually on the wall behind me as I'm talking to you. And um, he said he remembered me fondly from those days, and he still remembered me all these years, like decades later. That's the kind of guy William Shatner is. Very, very cool. Uh, first of all, to get the Commodore launched, uh, I had to do a lot of things as a product manager. I had to get manuals written. 
I wanted to do a programmer's reference guide, which is a 400 page thick uh, manual in a spiral form so programmers and software developers could use that. We wanted to give software developers a head start because we didn't have enough software. We needed cartridge games, so I called up Scott Adams, the pioneer who invented the adventure game. He had seven adventure games, which are basically word games. You know, you go, you know, you walk into a dark room, there's a candle in the middle. In the, di in the corner, you can see an axe on one side and a hammer on the other side and a closed door. What do you do? You know, and that's an adventure game. So I, I thought, geez, that should be easy to pour it over because it's just text and it won't take too much memory. So I called Scott Adams, who was living on an island in Florida, and Scott immediately agreed to port over his games and one of our one of them, one of my staff, uh, Andy Finkel, I think, helped him port those over, and so we had seven cartridge games immediately. I had recruited a product team. You know, you have to have a product team to do a product. So I and I recruited Neil Harris, who had a marketing and software and programming background. He had the best combination of everything. So he was like second in command. Andy Finkel was a was a. My gosh, a, a software programming guru who had design skills and all kinds of talents, and he was just super smart. So Andy Finkel and a few other people um, who who joined right, some of them right out of college. One of them I recruited from a Radio Shack behind the counter because I heard he was good at, at graphics. Later on, I recruited him, Jeff Bruett. He was like a video graphics expert, and he spent most of his career doing CGI in Hollywood and places like that. So the first thing that happened was we started, I said, I want to do 12 uh, programs on tape. Remember, in those days, we didn't have disk drives yet widely used. So we had to do software programs loaded from data sets, tape cassettes. So we had like a $100 tape cassette to go with a VIC, which was $299.95. At one point... Jack wanted flat membrane style keyboard. And I said, no, we need a full typewriter style keyboard like the PET. How can you go backward? The PET has full typewriter keys by this point, and the CBM used the same keyboard. And then we, we also had one key that was unassigned. So I said, let's put a yen and a pound sign on for our Japanese and UK friends, and we, and we did. So I assigned one of the keys myself. The next thing was these the my poor staff was so young they were all in their teens and 20s so we would be developing software I had I had specified that we do 12 programs on tape we would take some old black and white commodore games turn them into color jazz them up and put them on tape I wanted six utilities like home finance mortgage calculator a little spreadsheet things like that uh, so we did a six-pack of utility programs and a six-pack of games. One of the games I, I named, it was called Blue Meanies from Outer Space. And we put these two game packs together and we packaged them. But our, our programmers were working on those. But one day I came in and I said, why is everybody sitting around? And they said, well, the sales team came over and took all our computers for a trade show. And I said, what? So we're going to be down for a couple of days. I was livid, 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 livid. So when we got our computers back, I took our guys out into the bay. It was a big open bay with cubicles, like Herman Miller action office cubicles. And everybody could hear everybody. And I stood out there and I said, okay, here's the deal. From now on, anybody in this company who comes in and takes one of our computers, I will make sure they're fired them. I'll fire them myself and walk them out of the building. And I said that in a loud voice and everybody heard me. Nobody knew if I had the authority to do it, but everybody was scared to take our computers after that. Then I came back in and I said, you guys have to toughen up a little bit. You have to be more military. You have to have a mindset that if somebody comes to steal a computer, you just say, no, get out of here, okay? So I said, from now on, we're going to call ourselves the Vic Commandos. And we are going to act like guerrilla warriors because we are we didn't know the word skunk works at that time. So we called our so I gave ourselves the name Vic Commandos. And 
Neil Harris' father was in the advertising specialties business, and they had big, giant brass coins. And I said, can we get a symbol for us somehow? Is there something we can use as a symbol of our Vic Kameno? So he brought in these big, heavy brass coins that said good luck on one side and something else on the other side. It had a phoenix, which a phoenix, you know, rising from the ashes, the phoenix. So we, he handed them out to everybody. So each of us had our Vic coin. And we would flip them, and we would learn to flip them. And if, if you know anything about 1920s movies, there was a character named George Raft, an actor named George Raft, who always played gangsters, and he had a movie where he would flip this coin without looking at it, and he could just flip it while talking. <laughs> we all learned to do that. In the middle of this, I was giving interview. Jack said... You are the only person in the company who is authorized to give an interview to anybody anytime you want. By the way, as in my with my marketing hat on, I bought the back page of all the computer magazines at that time, and we had the back cover of all the computer magazines because if you have your product on the back page of a magazine, it looks like you own the magazine. And it's very prestigious, and nobody has to page through the magazine to find your ad. So I bought all the back covers. One time, a vice president tried, a new vice president later on in my career there, tried to cancel all the ads. And he said, I'm going to cancel all the ads, and then we'll decide what we do, and we'll redo it. And I said, hell, once you, re once you get rid of all the ads, they're gone. Somebody else will be in there in a flash. So I called all the magazines, and I told them, ignore the vice president's words. And they said, Okay, Michael, they didn't say, do you have the authority? You're not a vice president. How can you authorize this? They just said, okay, Michael. That vice president was gone six months later. Um, so so um, in 1980 and 81, we were all already talking about what we called the, <laughs> we called it the C20 and the C40. The C20 was the VIC-20. The C40, Commodore 40, was, was the 40-column Commodore 64. Now, when we were in Japan, we launched the VIC-20 in 1980 in Japan, 19, January 1981 in the U.S. Uh, when we were in Japan, Tony Tokai took me to a place where Japanese companies used to market test their products, and we snuck in. And we saw an NEC PC5000, which was a 32K computer with special function keys. And I said, we got to have those function keys. And it was a 32K computer. It was going to be $600. And I said, we're going to steal those function keys. So we put programmable function keys on the VIC-20, which also on the 64. And I knew that the PC5000 was going to be a 32K computer coming to the U.S. at some point at $600. So I said, we have to double that. So when we got back to the US, we started saying we need a 64K computer to leapfrog the 32K computers. The VIC, by the way, had 5K of RAM, 5 kilobytes. And when you turned it on, it netted down to 3,300 bytes, wow. which is one sheet of typing paper, including the spaces and letters. So that's how limited we were. But then we did the Commodore 64 and people said, what was the strategy behind it? Remember, one of my titles was marketing strategist. So I called this the bear in the woods strategy. What do you do when a bear chases you in the woods? You run like hell, you take off your knapsack, you throw it down in front of the bear, the bear stops to look at the knapsack, and then you run or clamber up a tree. Well, in this case, the knapsack was the VIC-20. You throw down a 5K, $300 color, full-featured color computer in front of the Japanese, and they go into an 18-month planning cycle because we all knew that's what they did. I was very well-versed on Japanese business. I had lived in Asia for two years. I knew Tony. We all knew this. And then when the Japanese come back with like a 32K computer, we already leapfrog them with a 64K computer, and they stop again. That's the next knapsack, and they go into a planning cycle. They never came into the low-end market because of what I call the bear in the wood strategy. Now, when the Commodore 64 was introduced, we introduced that with a lot of hoopla, again, with Shatner and a lot of great advertising. 
By the way, the advertising guys, by that time we had a new, we had a full new big marketing team and the marketing guys were very professional. We had an ad agency and the ad guys came in and they told Jack at your size company. Oh, by the way, we were the first company to sell a million microcomputers, which was the VIC-20. We were the first company to reach a billion dollars. We were the first personal computer company to reach a billion dollars in one year, one fiscal year ahead of Apple. So here we were having all these successes, and the Commodore 64, we threw that into the market, and that was uh, at under $600, and everybody went crazy over the Commodore 64 because now you had a 64 computer, 64K computer that could really do word processing and spreadsheets and graphics and databases. By the way, the four killer apps that were the first killer apps were word processing, spreadsheets, database management, and um, and graphics. Games were a big part. You know, I, I was in on the negotiations with Nintendo in Chicago. I went to, I went to um, Chicago with Jack. I said, we have to license high-end arcade games because the Vic and more so the Commodore 64 could display games at the same quality as arcades, which were a big deal. We all were playing games, video games and arcades. So I said, we should get Bally Midway games. And they were based in Chicago. We went to Chicago and met with the Bally Midway guys. And some, some people thought that Bally Midway was with the mafia because they had put game machines in bars and so forth. And they thought they were kind of connected in some way. We don't know that, but they sure had interesting ways of dressing. They had silver ties and big diamond stick pins and they, and and when we met with them we said here's the royalty deal we want to give you and they said fine and at the end of the meeting jack said what well, should we do a contract and and they said no just send us a letter and i turned to jack and jack turned to me and jack said write the letter mike and show it to the lawyers so i wrote a one page letter like four paragraphs long that was the whole deal it even said if later on economics force us to lower the price, we can adjust the royalty proportionally. And they agreed to that. So when we walked out into the hallway, Jack looked at me and he said, I don't know if those guys are the mafia or not, but whatever they are, I wish every deal went that smoothly. I'd love to do business every time like this. And we laughed like crazy. So about the same time I was trying to negotiate a deal with Nintendo to get Donkey Kong and some of the other great games. By the way, Bally Midway had Pac-Man and a whole bunch of other great games. That's what we were licensing. So I, I, I did a deal with the vice president of Nintendo to license all their games and I brought it to Jack and the contract was ready to be signed. I brought it into Jack and Jack looked at it and he said, I'm not going to do the deal. And I said, excuse me? He said, I, I'm not doing the deal with Nintendo. And I said, why? And he said, I'm just not doing it. And the reason was we had the deal with, with Bally Midway. We didn't want to upset them or insult them. And we already had the Bally deal, so he didn't want to go with Nintendo. So I lost face. So I had to go back to the vice president at Nintendo, who I had patiently negotiated a really good deal with, and tell him the deal was off. Nintendo was so upset, they decided to do their own game machine, and that's why they went and did the Nintendo game machine. Wow. And I'm kind of indirectly wow. responsible, or rather Jack is. That's how the Nintendo game machine got started, because well, Jack turned down the deal. Now, here's another thing that happened. A group of software programmers at a, at a company called HAL Labs in Japan had done a Pac-Man version that was better than Atari. There was only one game we could not license from Bally Midway, and that was Pac-Man, because they had already licensed it to Atari, but we got all their other games. One day, Japan sends me this cartridge, and it's, it's Pac-Man on a cartridge, and it's perfect. It's better than the arcade. And I went, shoot, this is wonderful. So Jack became aware of that, and we showed it to him, and we said, what do we do? And we all talked about it, Kit Spencer and all of us, and... Finally, Jack came back to me and he said, here's what we're going to do with the Pac-Man game. We're going to sell it in the UK and we're going to call it Jelly Monsters. Apparently that was, I think Kit Spencer might have named that. It sure sounds like something English, right? So we're going to call it Jelly Monsters. 
And I said, so what happens when Atari sues us? And he said, don't worry about it. Bally Midway won't back them up. And secondly, we'll escrow royalties. And when they sue us, we'll tell us, number one, here are the royalties on the games we sold. And then we'll agree to stop selling it. He was absolutely right. By the time Atari got around to suing us, we sold a million Jelly Monsters cartridges, probably sold a million VIC-20s in the UK just on that game alone, <laughs> and Jelly Monsters became a classic. I developed a little, a little uh, catchphrase from that, which I learned from Jack. People used to say, what did you learn from Jack? And I said, business reality dictates legality. And I learned, do the business reality first and the legality will follow. It doesn't mean cheat or commit crimes, but it means there's a lot of room for breaking rules if you know the legal implications and how to deal with it. And, and apparently Jack did. So Jack was technically violating a patent, but he knew Bally Midway wouldn't back up Atari. Atari would be very happy to take the royalties because they were losing money. And the bottom line was, we sold a lot of computer. The beginning of the end started in summer 1983. There was an article in Newsweek or Business Week that showed Texas Instruments selling more computers than us and having a larger market share. And we knew this wasn't the case. Our engineers back-engineered the TI-99-4. By the way, uh, uh, Texas Instruments was the, the second largest uh, seller of home computers at this time. Our engineers back engineered the Texas Instruments computer. They found out that they could not be making a profit on the CPU, the computer. They had to make all their profits on peripherals and software. So when the engineers told this to Jack, we went to a convention. The, I think it was the June... 93, 1983 CES show. You know, the, T, the TI booth looked like a castle and we looked like the serfs, the peasants' uh, village next to the castle. And I, I mentioned that to Jack and, and Jack was really upset and he looked at that and he was thinking and he said, okay, we're going to announce that we're going to cut all of our peripheral and software prices in half. Texas Instruments won't be able to survive that because they only make money on their peripherals and software. And we make money on the computers as well as the others. So he announced that. The, the day he announced that, the president of consumer uh, products and home computers division of TI came over. He was about a foot taller than Jack. And he was yelling and he was upset, and he was telling Jack, what are you doing? You're screwing up the market. There's no way, Bubba. And he was giving Jack, and Jack was just looking at him and smiling. And he turned and walked away. The president of, of the division responsible for home computers took his staff, got on a plane, flew back to Texas, and two days later announced that Texas Instruments is exiting the home computer market. So we drove TI out of the market, and by doing that, Jack inadvertently killed Commodore. And here's how it happened. Let's say you have a $100 product, a peripheral from Commodore. If you're a retailer, you probably paid $50. So you paid $50 wholesale, and you're selling this for 100 Jack cut the prices in half, so now the retail price is $50, but that's what a retailer paid to buy it, so he's not making any money on it. So all of our retailers insisted on what they call stock balancing. Either we had to give them free product or give them new product cheaper. That cut into our Christmas sales to compound the problem Texas Instruments started dumping their $300 computer for $86 a piece just to dump them on the market, which also cut into our sales. So the fourth quarter of 1983, 
was shaping up to be weaker. Irving Gould, the chairman of Commodore, was already being told by his senior executives, some a whole bunch of gray-haired executives who were in the company, that the wildcat style of Jack Trammell was no longer relevant because they were a billion-dollar company, we were a billion-dollar company. So they were whispering his, in his ear that they should gently get rid of Jack. Jack made kind of a strategic error because he said he wanted to bring his sons together. He had three sons. One was an expert in finance, one in operations. He had been in Asia for a couple of years. Another was a technology expert who had a degree in astrophysics from, from uh, Columbia. He had experiments that went, went into, were in the space program. And he also helped develop the PET. So he wanted to bring his sons in as vice presidents, and he confided to me that he wanted his three sons to come together as a family and be located physically together so they could come together. And he wanted to bring his sons together, so he wanted to make them vice presidents. There was a consumer electronics show in January 1984 in Las Vegas. Right after the show, they had the board meeting in New York, board of directors meeting, at, I think they had it at um, uh, the attorney's office. I'm not sure, but I seem to recall it, the attorney's office because in the middle of the board of directors meeting, our corporate attorney's secretary called me on the phone and said, Michael, I want you to be the first to know. Terrible news. Jack has been ousted from the company. He's been invited to resign. He's already on a plane back to California while the board meeting is continuing to go on. And that's how I found out that Jack was basically ousted. I heard later that Irving Gould offered to buy a portion of his stock to ease, ease the pain and that Jack was then invited to sell the rest of his stock on the market if he wanted. As the news hit, it was like a bomb blast went off. The first thing that happened was the stock plummeted, and in six months, the stock went from $90 to $6. And those of us who had unregistered stock that we had been given lost all that value, and it wound up under the option value. I personally lost a million dollars on paper that I should have earned that I lost from that one action. The next thing that happened was the the gray-haired old men who were left in charge of the company, all the senior vice presidents and so forth, who had whispered in Irving's Gould, telling him that this would be a good thing for Commodore, they said, we should become IBM or Apple. We, don't, we should stop doing consumer products. The next thing we know, um, Jack is offered a deal to take over Atari, which was bleeding money for years. Jack told me that when Atari called him, he said, I'll take it over, but only if uh, you accept all the debts until the day I take it over. I'm not responsible for your mistakes. And they agreed. At Commodore, all of us set a, like a metal watch, like an alarm clock. In May of 1984, 35 top executives, including me, walked out of the company. We all quit on the same. We didn't coordinate this. That was just we set our clock. We get we either had a choice to go to the June Consumer Electronics Show or to leave the company in May. So we left. And then after that, they did not have enough talent to create new generations of computers. They had lost their talent base. So they had to negotiate with Amiga to buy Amiga. They paid $23 million for Amiga, which I thought they, they overpaid. <clears throat> the way they, it was told to me, the guy who became president of Commodore, Marshall Smith, he became the highest paid executive in the Delaware Valley despite Commodore losing money for, well, under him. Marshall Smith was totally unprepared to run a computer company. He had no idea whatsoever. He listened to the gray-haired executives who started telling him, we should become IBM, so they brought in the Amiga, which was a good deal in terms of the computer technology, but they didn't seem to arrange to have development talent come with the package, so Amiga's technology started to suffer a little bit. And then at some point, 
They simply abandoned the Amiga. They became the number one IBM clone maker in Europe, which was insane. And the company basically went into a death spiral. And 10 years later, in 1994, I was I had been consulting and doing other things for a while and been on my own. I wrote a book called The Home Computer Wars and I did I did a lot of consulting. I had my own consulting firm, mostly doing technology innovation. Before I took that job, I said I think I'll go to see Irving Gould and see if he wants me to help save the company. And I, Mady was the president. Mady, the president, was a doppelganger for Jack Tramiel. <laughs> Short, rotund, swarthy, accented. Gruff, he was Jack. He was a clone of Jack Tramiel. You wouldn't believe the similarity. I felt so comfortable. Mady was uncomfortable because I felt so comfortable with him. It was like talking to Jack. It was exactly the same personality, except they were all clueless. They said they were making a 64-bit uh, game machine. I mentioned in a meeting that the VIC-20 was the first million-seller microcomputer, and two of the executives, young executives, raised their hand and they said, no, Michael, you're wrong. The Commodore 64 was the first million seller. And I asked, I, I was horrified and I asked them a few more simple questions and I realized all the corporate memory of Commodore had been wiped away, like a, wiping words off a whiteboard. They had no corporate memory or sense of legacy. And they were trying to keep up with Nintendo by making a game machine. And I told Irving, I'm sorry, but I don't think it's gonna work. And I said, and I, and also I said to Irving, would, would you like a chief operating officer to help turn this around? That's what I know how to do. I've been doing it as a consultant for years now. And he said, well, actually we were thinking you might wanna be the product manager for the new game machine, <laughs> which was such an insult to me, such an insult, I just, shook my head and I said, sorry, and I just walked out. Well, Michael, it's well, like Michael, we could honestly like, do like another two or three yeah, hours the amount of incredible yeah. stories you've got to tell. If people do want to keep up to date with like kind of what you're up to and also get more of your Commodore memories, there's a really good Facebook group that you're quite active in, the Commodore International Historic Society on Facebook. I started out contributing to that and sharing old memos from my files and discovering all kinds of things because we're keeping alive the legacy of Commodore. Not to keep alive history per se, but there are lots and lots of lessons, as you can imagine from what I've said today, that apply to today's technology skunk works and rule breakers and innovators and managers. Lots and lots of lessons that would otherwise have been lost. 